blessed this weekend and today to have Winnie Owens Hart, John Thomas, and Raman Tarnash. Uh, we have them here to really share their life history and stories and connections through ceramics and community and building a village together. Jahan Thomas, I'm gonna give, there's a lot here, a lot to remember, a lot of, they, they're doing a lot, so I wanna get it accurate and share that with you. Um, Jahan Thomas is a black visual artist, educator, mother, and ceramicist in North Philly. Um, she is also helping us write an educator's guide for a worldview of ceramics. Uh, ceramics. Um, she has also been uh, very fundamental in helping me learn about ceramic. I am not a ceramicist, and I am in charge of the ceramics initiative here at Grounds of Sculpture and expanding it. So she's been wonderful you know, assisting me and teaching me about ceramics. Um, she has worked at the Clay Studio of Philadelphia, Fleischer Art Memorial, and the Free Library of Philadelphia. And it is her interest in exploring the diverse language of African pottery and its diaspora. Robin Turnage here. Um, also been uh, giving me the business and giving me a hard time <laughs> in a good way. Uh, they are a combo, as you will soon see. Uh, Robin is also a mother, educator, artist, multi-talented. Um, she has created a podcast called Potters of Color 2.0. You should also on all platforms. You should check out. Um, and she works with, which I learned this week, works with children and adults um, in recovery to better their lives. They are connected to Miss Winnie Owens Hart over here as uh, her student. <laughs> um, Winnie is recognized as an educator, artist, curator, scholar, filmmaker, author, and critical think thinker in matters of play, art, and culture. She has been a thread that I've learned through many she has influenced many, many lives of, of people um, in the ceramics field and in the education field. She has taught at Howard University for more than 37 years and conducted research, exhibited, and presented works and lectures nationally and internationally. Her work is in the collections of the Smithsonian, the Kohler, Everson University, and private collections. And she is currently collecting all of these stories to write a book on African-American ceramic artists from the 18th to 20th century. stories and different techniques. We have uh, multimedia videos, slideshows to share um, uh, information that Winnie has brought to us. Um, and they're going to they're gonna take over. They're going to be moving around. There's going to be a lot happening. They ask questions. It's a conversation. We're seated in a circle to have that uh, familiar aspect of conversational. Okay? So I'll hand it over to uh, these women here. Hi. Uh, I'm Winnie Owens Hart. And these two ladies are my apprentices for this particular technique. So we're doing two techniques today, one from Nigeria and one from Ghana. And I always like to uh, tell my students that I teach the technique too, that I'm just an apprentice. I'll never be a master potter. And what they learn and what they practice, they have to give credence to the women of Ipetumodu in Nigeria or the women of Kuli in Ghana. So for the last 10 years, I've been in a village in Cooley. Uh, and um, they are going to, we're, a lot's going to be going on So if, if, uh, in terms of us making. But I would like to say that what I see important about this is it was my own interest that, that made me live in Nigeria, made me live in Ghana. But what I realized is that in the school systems, they never have clay because it's an expensive thing. You have to have a kill, all these tools. Well, what you'll learn with this technique, it is really uh, something that you could do in your classroom easily. So we're going to start with uh, a movie that I made about uh, four villages in, in Ghana. See, a lot of stuff that you'll read, all, a material, they'll, they'll say something like, oh, well, if it's, a, if it's a female potter, then her husband is an ironsmith, which is not true. And people also write that, uh, like, <laughs> oh, they go, uh, well, I've been to Africa, or I know about Africa, 
And I said, okay, that's a continent. Tell me about a country. You know, and then a lot of times they just don't get it, you know. So what I'm trying to do is to really um, bring the experience here, or I also have people that come to my house in Ghana and we go work in the Pottery Village, so firsthand. And that usually I do just two people because I don't want things to change. You know, I want things to evolve in the villages as they would without our influences. Uh, right now, we're going to take you from Nigeria to Ghana and back. So what, what I'd like for you to, to see are how they use the techniques to make things by hand, all of us. So we're all going to start at the same time. OK. So in Nigeria, the village I worked in, all the pots are started from the bottom. And then they, they're finished. So I'm going to start a pot from the beginning. Normally, what, what would happen with the clay is they would have it in a certain part of their uh, house, and they would put it down, and they would do this. And this perfect circle or sphere would, would come out. And when I first started teaching this at the university, I made the students take off their shoes so they would get the idea. And what would always happen is there would be a, a hole in the middle, which was wrong, because you see somebody do something, and you think you know what they did, so for a long time, I, I put holes in the bottom of mine until I realized how they were balancing themselves. So since I'm not going to take my shoes off, <laughs> I'll make my circle here. What we're doing is we're taking some clay in the ticky-tacky state of moisture. That means it'll stick to your fingers. And we're wedging it by slapping it into itself. And what Jahan and I are about to do is start the top half of the pot in the following fashion. Jahan will be doing the large pots in a traditional fashion on sand. I will do, be doing the same thing, except I will be emphasizing or improvising by doing it on canvas, which is how I've been teaching it in a classroom. So and these are the top halves, and we'll be punching them out shortly. And what Miss Robin means about ticky-tacky, it's the word that we describe the consistency of the clay. So we have to uh, traditionally, as you saw in the video, the, the women are processing the, the clay from the men gathering it from the riverbed all the way to the point where they're making their pots. So Miss Winnie has trained us in the way that we actually process our own clay. So yes, we do get, you know, uh, you know, a box of clay that we ordered. However, in order to make it the consistency that we need for the Ghanaian technique, we have to um, combine uh, two different types. So we have the fresh clay, and then we also have um, really, really uh, slip uh, consistency, almost like a paste. And we, for hours, we sat here and processed the clay. Um, so we have a bucket of that, so that took hours. So the clay that we're working with um, is charged with, with a lot of our energy. Um, so we start with a ball, we'll start at the same time. She's got a ball and I got a ball. This technique, um, both techniques are done standing up. So you'll see, you'll see, you saw some, some women were sitting down, but you'll see us standing up. So first we have to center the ball of clay and you can, um, we have to open the clay up. 
So I'll put my finger. See how easy that is. I gotta bite it. Don't want to do that. I have to open up the open up the ball here. I'll move over a little bit. Meanwhile, I took my ball of clay and adhered it to the canvas by making a small ledge and then wetting it so that it sticks. Now I'm gonna wet one finger and stick it straight down the center, all the way to the floor. Give it a little twist and come out. And I'm gonna take two fingers and pull, pull the clay up toward my outside hand. And this is improvisational. I want that to be clear. This is not traditional because I'm using a piece of canvas. One of the things that's really wonderful, like Miss Winnie had mentioned, is that we, we're really just using our bodies. And a lot of our uh, indigenous and, and specifically in, on the continent we're talking about, in the country of Ghana that we're talking about, we didn't have a ruler or anything like that. You can see that the women are using their bodies, they're using their hands, they're using um, their, their fists, and those are our tools. So, um, you ready, Mama? Yep. So what we then are getting our handkerchief. You might have saw that in the video. There might have been a leaf or a piece of fabric. Here we have a, a handkerchief, and we're going to use that, like you saw in the video, to shape to shape our pot. We wet the clay completely and totally. And then we take the fold aside, line it up with our two fingers, and press it down into the center of the pot. I'm gonna go around once, twice, I'm gonna go around until the clay tells me, okay, I got it. I'm ready. Now, clay doesn't really talk. Yes, it does. But it does communicate. Okay, so this is the beginning of the first half for a Nigerian pot. I said that for my grandson. He'd be like, I don't And you know notice that. it still moves because I put a lot of ash in the middle. I've tried dry clay, doesn't work. It just gets muddy. So you have to have the ash. So you want to find the highest part on here. And you want to even off the bottom. This does two things. It gives it texture, but it also evens out the wall even more than the stone. I was in my 20s when I started traveling and getting the idea that this is what I wanted to do. My parents bought me clay as a little girl, so I was always working with clay. I saw, when I was, before I went to school, back in the 18th century, stop, <laughs> stop. I uh, saw a film. I was working at Eli Ife Black Humanitarian Center uh, and also at the School Without Walls in North Philly. And because I was uh, with the public school system, I could uh, check out movies. And I saw this movie. Well, let me, let, me, let me tell you what the incentive was. I went to the Philadelphia College of Art, which is now called the University of the Arts. And the only thing they ever did was talk about Asian uh, or English wear. And so I would ask them, I said, well, what about, what about indigenous? And they wouldn't mention Marie uh, uh, Martinez. That was it. Didn't tell us anything about it. You, you know, I just did it on my own. And then I asked them, I said, what about African ceramics? And the reason I asked them is because I was in my doctor's. I grew up in segregated Virginia. 
And everything was, you know, the blacks went to school here, couldn't go to a pool, couldn't go to a movie. You have to go to DC if you want to go to a movie or go to a museum. So my mother was a woman who had a lot of books. She always had books for us. And when I was, before I started school, I have an older brother that's six years older and a sister three years older. And when I was in school, my mother would take the encyclopedias off the, uh, you know, off the bookcase. And I'd have to put them back in numerical order and alphabet so I could learn my numbers and alphabets before I go to school, regular school. So I would pull out the A, and I'm looking through it, and it's Africa. And it was a continent, and it would show you this, this elephant here, this huge thing here. This, and I was just fascinated because what I saw was this huge pot. I mean, if I'm doing this, it was even bigger. And that stuck in my head forever. There was a woman who did um, arts and crafts in the basement of the school, of the African American school. And um, so I made this pot. And I'll, that, I'm going to leave that. Um, so I just kind of said, I really like that. And my, then my parents were giving me clay. And um, then I went to my doctor's office one day. And there was a Time magazine. And it's like in a black family, you had Jet. This is a ancient history. You had Jet, Ebony. Uh, the NAACP newsletter, I can't, I can't remember the name of it. And I'm looking around, and maybe one person might know what I'm talking about, but I'm not looking at any particular person. Uh, so we had all of this stuff. Well, on the cover of Time magazine, there were two black people in what was a drawing of the, you know, uh, Eve, you know, flowers and, and everything and no clothes and so they had to put, you know, leaves in front. And it said the oldest known Homo sapien has come from uh, Ethiopia. And I'm going like, well, uh, Ethiopia is in, is in the continent of Africa. That, so that means we're the oldest known Homo sapien. So that really cooked it for me because I said, well, if they're people, they have to have pots or baskets. You know, and so that's how my mind was going as a little girl. So I'll speed up to um, when I was at PCA. I, if somebody had an accent, I go. I still do this. I go to Home Depot, whatever. If you have an accent and you look like me, where are you from? And the first thing they'll say is Africa. I said no. I said you're not from Africa. You know every country. I said, what country are you from? So when they know that you know something about them, for me to ask them, what country are you from, not continent? And oh, you know this, that, and the other. So that's basically what I've done all my life, because I was really interested in talking to somebody from the continent. So at peace, at a, I'm going back to Ile Ife and that movie and that big pot. And in the movie, they had these women making these big pots. And I'm going like, Jesus. So I, I saw the thing 25 times, but it was in German. So at, somebody here knows something about me, Elaife. I don't know exactly how much she knows, but um, when I was at Elaife, I was only ceramics instructor. And so when I saw this thing, I said, oh. I got this technique down. And I made this big pot that went in the kiln. I mean, just filled it up. And so I showed it to my comrades, you know, my other teachers. And you know, I was like, like a peacock, <laughs> really. You know, just proud of myself. I had made this huge pot. Everybody was just impressed by it. I put it in the kiln, blows up in a million pieces, right? OK, remember that I worked at Ile Ife Black Humanitarian Center for the next part of this story. So what happens is pot making seems to be a collective. 
So once the pot is done, you take it off and you put it in the sun. And what we would do, every morning we would make so many bottoms. And then by mid-afternoon, we could add more clay to it. So I'm going to show you just, I'm going to put on one, one, uh, one coil just to show you what I saw in that film. Ready? So Jahan has advanced pretty far in what she's doing. Some of you may have saw her pull out this corn cob. Um, I'm going to start from there. We've already kind of rounded out the top. And I'm going to run the corn cob around the bottom to maintain the shape. And then I'm going to take the point of it and run it along midway so that I know where I'm going to turn the lip out at. And what I show the people that I teach this to at Fleischer Art Memorial is that first I will start at 12 o'clock, then I'll go to 2 o'clock, then I'll go to 3 o'clock. So we're at 12 o'clock, and this time I'm holding the rag here as opposed to all the way inside. 12 o'clock, now I'm going to take my thumb and press it to 2 o'clock. And now I'm going to press it to three. And to piggyback on what Winnie was saying about Ileife, I'm a student of Ileife Humanitarian Center in North Philadelphia. That is where I met Charles Searles, Leroy Johnson, Walter Edmonds, and Miss Winnie Owens Hart. Barbara Bullock? Barbara Bullock, yes. Martha Jackson Jarvis? Yes. Betty Lee Craft, who's in the audience. Um, my mother was a paper bag passing black woman. And she didn't want her two children, my brother David and myself, to ever have any fear about being black and proud in 1960 America. So she made sure that we got a pride and a love for our African roots. She took us to Ileife, where I saw black hands and clay for the first time by Mr. Leroy Johnson, who just transitioned into the ancestor world. Uh, later on, when I was in college, I thought about Mr. Johnson because I was having trouble learning how to throw on a potter's wheel. I didn't have wheel throwing in high school. It wasn't until I was dead in the middle of a tuition-bearing college where if you fail, you cost your parents, oh, a great deal of money, that I was in front of a wheel for the first time. I called Mr. Johnson up. Mr. Johnson had me come over and sat me down and got me comfortable throwing on a potter's wheel. So right on for black hands and clay. Go, Jahan, tell him something. Let's see. So we got these lips going. Now, when you hear us say the lip, the bottom, the lip, the way that we see this pottery is somewhat like a reflection of our own bodies. So there's actually an anatomy to how we're looking at these pots. So when we speak of uh, Cooley and Ghana, how they start with the lip first, that we're thinking about the very top of a pot. Uh, we also, you know, you can consider, you know, the bottom being like the booty or the side, uh, the waist, maybe a few inches from the top could be like the shoulders. So you can kind of um, really see how we're trying to use the body as a, as a synonym to a tool of measurement. So we don't need a ruler, we don't need any things like that. We're working with our hands, we're working with the curvatures of our hands. Uh, Miss Winnie's pot that she's working on, it has her whole 
identity and her, her, her finger uh, prints in it. That pot will never match anybody else's palms but hers. My pot, no one will, no one will ever match my, my, the curvature of my pot because it's made with my hands. And that's something that's really sacred about this tradition and um, something that's really valuable that, 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 that drew me to, to this process. So uh, right now we created the lip of the pot um, and now we're at the stage where you saw in the video where um, some of the women were stuffing the pot. When we created the lip, we're taking away, we're subtracting because clay work is definitely math. So we're subtracting the clay and now we have to add to it in addition. So we have to add to the equation. The pot is the equation. So we have to add clay to that equation to stuff it. Um, and you'll kind of see those stages. So um, were you getting ready to stuff yours? I'm just gonna put, were you gonna get ready to stuff yours? Yes, okay. I'm gonna stuff mine. So Miss Robin will stuff hers. I'm just gonna fix my lip a little so bit. So again, I'm wedging. And this is, this is good dirty work. <laughs> I am proud to say I am an official mud skipper <laughs> in terms of clay. I get dirty because of clay, but it's the most satisfying dirt you'll ever be. So there's something about working with clay that's really spiritual and really helps you kind, to, kind of uh, process things in life because a lot of what's true in clay is true in life. Oh, shit. You know? Uh, uh, we came to this process as already clay lovers. Mm -hmm. However, when working with clay, um, you really start with a European Eurocentric foundation. Mm. And um, there's nothing wrong with European, you know, clay, but where's everybody else at? So, exactly. you know, you just want to explore other techniques. And what drew me to the call for this was, was that it, 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 it matched my reflection. The clay matches my reflection, the process matches my reflection. And that's what really made me excited when um, the call came for Miss Winnie looking for an apprentice. So um, we're almost thirsty for it. Also, uh, what, what most uh, Eurocentric schools and institutions speak of when they talk about clay and most everything else is it's almost as though they transport it from pre-history to their history when speaking about clay. But in fact, every culture under the sun has clay ruts. And I said ruts. For those who don't understand, I meant roots. So we all have clay at the base of our, our ruts. And also, um, for anybody who didn't understand the statement I made about uh, paper bag passing, that is known as if you are darker than a paper bag, you don't pass as white. My mother was a paper bag passing black woman. Okay, so that's just to clarify that. So we ready to stuff it? Yeah, you could, yeah, we can stuff it. So we have to stuff the clay because we have to have something to punch out. You saw in the video, the woman was punching out her pot. Um, the lip, okay, would have been, is gonna be stiffened up. In our case, we're gonna use something called liquid sunshine, which is our hot, hot gun, <laughs> hot air gun. And essentially what we would do is blow that hot air gun over the lip to stiffen it up before we um, stuff it. After we stuff it and let that sit, then we're able to punch it out. But for the time that we're in Hamilton, New Jersey, we're gonna just, uh, we got a few already prepared stuff for you. This okay. is the heat gun we use. A blow dryer will do as well. Yeah. And some people use a torch, a weed torch. Yeah. I wouldn't do that because you might set your whole house on fire. That won't be any fun. So you're gonna stuff, we're gonna stuff ours. Yeah, let's go stuff it. So every technique, there's a reason to it. 
So we're not just, just doing it to do it. There's a way to do it. Um, every finger is your tool. Your whole body is your tool. As you can see, Miss Winnie physically going around and around that pot over and over again. And notice that we're, we're bent at our half. We're bent. And that is part of that technique. None of those women were sitting down with a glass of iced tea next to them. They were bent at the waist, working with the clay. And you can ask any questions as we go. But if you could imagine, maybe each woman might be working at 20 at a time. What, you know, just in clay, usually you don't, you know, you, you working on more than one at a time is, is really good, because give it that time to set up. Oh yes, so we've, we've been here a couple days prior to this, this uh, today. It takes hours because we're working in a traditional technique. We hand processed all this clay. So um, getting it out the box is not good enough. Out the box isn't good enough for, for us or the technique to respect the women back in the villages, so we really try our best to, to meet that. So the preparation was definitely, um, clay is just laborious anyway, but uh, we value those, those techniques, so we, we're, we're glad to go, to go to that length. Otherwise, our pots would not work in, a, in, those, in, a, in that way. In other words, we honor the technique itself. Even though I may have done some improvisational uh, things to make sure that my process, the process of this technique is workable inside of a classroom, we honor the technique, we honor the women of Cooley. I always tell my students when I'm being traditional and when I'm imp 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 improvising. So, uh, Right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So what we did, like I said, we, we just stuffed our pots. We got a little magic for you. So. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> so um, these are what you had heard in the video in a leather hard consistency. So um, I can kind of go around. Uh, the lip, which is the top, is stiff to the point where I can go like this and it's not squishy, okay? The, the clay inside is rather soft because you're gonna get ready to see us do this next technique. So, okay, so yep. this is how you build a pot, just consistently no wonder, adding the coil, the That's why the back of my ears was pressing it into the preceding <laughs> coil. And of course, you have to know at what point the clay is either soft enough or hard enough for you to do, for you to add. That's all right. I did a workshop at Syracuse with some students, and I was doing the demo, and so we kind of stopped right there, and then the teachers went to lunch. Okay, yeah, we can move that. Now, I have been doing these workshops all over the country and outside of the country, and this never happened. We went to lunch, Pot was about like this, and we had three of them going at one time. When we came back for lunch, they had built these pots up this high. And it, you know, it just never occurred to me because I was so into the tradition that you know, I'm just following that rule and that height. So um, I don't know if you know David McDonald. Okay, he has, a, 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 after the students did that, he decided to do the same kind of thing. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Well, it's over. No. 
Cooking. Storage. And my experience with the cooking is in Nigeria. You know, and, and if, if people don't know this, um, they would make a pot much larger than this, dig it a third of the way or half the way in the ground, and they put a wooden, wooden circle over it. But when I went to get water, I didn't drink the water because I was, I was scared. Um, but they, uh, the water is just as cool, you know. Is that the same thing your grandmother did? Absolutely. What part of Ghana are you from? I was born in Kumasi. Okay. I'm Volta region. I wasn't, I, I, uh, the, okay, I'm not going to say. So, uh, no, you know I got the little D DNA thing done and people going like, ah. <laughs> so. It turned out at one point that it was um, where I actually live in Ghana and have my house is where my ancestors came from. And then I don't know if you all know about DNA, but it changes because it depends on how many uh, people, I'm just going to say people, that they sample. And the more people they sample that look like us, the closer we get to where we came from. Well, I think that's really great, you know, to have earlier exposure of a, the full language of what clay offers a lot of different cultures. You know, I particularly want to go back to my high school and, and, and share this technique because if I would have gotten that? some of this a little bit earlier, I, it, I mean, it's going it, to blow somebody's mind. It's going to set somebody off track. So as a collegiate student, um, you know, being able to have the interest in the world language of ceramics and clay and pottery, I really think it gives you a better scope of your practice and it, it really uh, breaks down the already so, proposed hierarchy of what clay can be in Western practice. So um, this really is a treat well, to be here and, and we're really happy to, to be here with you all. Um, please okay. make sure that you cite everything that you've learned in person because that's, that's really what's important. We're, we all don't create just on our own. We all are really inspired by each other. But what happens is when we don't cite that, everybody, you know, just figuring out Picasso is inspired, you know, inspired by African aesthetics. So it's because things weren't cited. So, you know, that's, that's one of the really important pr practice that, that Miss Winnie has really established with us as well. Yeah. Yeah, we came together uh, from a competition at Fleischer Art Memorial in South Philadelphia, and uh, Miss Winnie, you know, wanted to wants to pass on, you know, the technique, and we went through a wonderful, grueling time, but it was fabulous, and I, I never it was set me onto a wonderful track. Yeah. Uh, my daughter is here, <laughs> and so we're definitely passing it all down. Yeah, it was a, an interesting vetting process as well. I remember going into the office to have an interview with Winnie, and I'm thinking I'm going to see Winnie. But Winnie had this, this graphic on the computer while she asked several questions about, why are you interested in this? I have no memory of this. I disavow <laughs> all <laughs> uh, uh. So, um... I, too, have my daughter and my two grandchildren here. It's my grandson in the back, my daughter waving, and my granddaughter in front. My granddaughter has also uh, assisted me while teaching Nigerian and Ghanaian pottery at Fleischer Art Memorial. We're going to get her on the payroll. But um, also, um, about the apprenticeship, uh, what I love most about it is that uh, we had the opportunity to show what real sisterhood is about because we were competitors and we had 17 other competitors at first and it whittled down to four. So we were competitors, 
But what happened was we became collaborators. And that's what sisterhood and brotherhood is about. Working, right, working together. Everybody in here is related by the Y chromosome. So that means we have to work together to turn the world back in its right, more positive direction. We just lost Pharaoh Saunders, who said in his lyrics, one of the most positive things I have ever heard, because as we all know, the lyrics and the music our children are hearing nowadays is very ugly. But what did Pharaoh Saunders say? The creator has a master plan. Peace and happiness for every man. Don't get me started, because I'll get up and see. <laughs> OK. All right, back to class. You see why I'm so quiet? <laughs> <laughs> but I want to I piggyback on what she said about trying to make sure that we don't lose this part of the story. You know, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a book um, that goes from 17th, 18th century to the 20th century African American ceramics. And people don't even know that, I mean, when I was at Howard, we would go to Ansika, and people say, I, I didn't know you all had clay at that black school, you know. Um, and in terms of the color network, no, I won't go there. That started with um, Ansika having these little uh, me sub-meetings after the main meeting. And so uh, Bobby Scroggins and I were the two people who did it originally. And uh, one, of the, it, one of the episodes was, it was called um, Color, Color, Color Clay, something like that. And it was really funny because everybody there, except for three ladies, were African American. And so we, went, we talked about the work and what people were doing and things like that. And then at the end, the two women came up to us. They said, when you said colored clay, we thought you meant the clays with the different colors. So it, it was interesting how this whole <laughs> how this whole larger organization got started. Uh, but what's important to me is that the technique keeps going on because it is being um, uh, the village I worked in was probably 800 years old when they used to tell me my mother's mother mother you know when I said how long ago that's how they would tell me in time and. Um, it was, it was such a big pottery uh, place that there was going to be a, a, commercial, a commercial clay making place in the same town. Because they heard that the, when I, when I, what I taught at before was the University of uh, uh, Ile Ife. You know, I ended up in the same place I began. And um, they were going to. The Ipetumodu was the next town over, where it's a pottery town. And they heard there was going to be a an, uh, an, uh, smaller college you know, built in Ipetumodu. And they kicked the women, the potter, pottery women, off the land. And they, you know, they ruined the pottery. And that pottery had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years. So I was talking to uh, another artist, and I was really upset that this was, the, this was what was going on all across the continent of Africa, but what I knew specifically in that part of West Africa. And it was going to be lost forever. And so she said to me, she said, Winnie, you've been teaching this technique for about 40 years to thousands of people. And she said, that's, that's how it's going to continue to go. And I never thought of it like that. So you all have a responsibility when you leave here today to go make one of these pots or have us come to your school. Right now, we're going to go back to travel in Ghana, Mvuli, and Kuli, excuse me. And um, now we're at the process where we saw in the video where we're going to punch out. So you saw that the woman had a very large uh, piece. I mean, it's almost 
maybe smaller than a tire. I mean, it was huge. So we're, we're working in a much smaller space. So right now, what I have here is the, the filled mm -hmm. pot stuffed with soft clay. This was done a few days ago, so it's perfect, okay? To the point where I could just go like that. The first part of, before we punch out though, is we have to scrape off the, um, in this case, some of the sand and just some of the older stiffened up clay. And, you know, staying with our natural elements, depending on where you are, what country you're in, you may have different materials. Um, this is Miss Swinney's uh, shell here uh, from a snail. And what I'm gonna do is use this edge to scrape diagonally around the pot to just reveal some of some more fresh clay so that I can so that I can um, scrape off some of this. I'm also um, oh yeah, I'll wait. Okay, do that. All right, so I'm just gonna put this on my on my knee and carefully go round and round. Two minutes. Okay. With this with this shell. Now what they forgot to tell you is that in, in Cooley, Two minutes. you're rolling the pot on your knees. And so you have to be covered. So what happens is the first thing we were taught when we walked, went in the village was this. So you wrap, and they tell you to do this, to be modest. You know, you still keep working. But actually, when you normally what they would do is they would have their knees bare. And you do this, and you're turning the pot with your knees and punching out at the same time. So what I'm doing right now, you can see I'm punching out, but look where my hands are. You heard in the video, it said that the, one of the most important tools is the hand. I'm able to punch, I'm really punching hard. Somebody will be like, ow, if, <laughs> if I punched them with the might that I'm using. But I'm punching into my hand and that's why I'm able to punch as hard as I can. And while I'm doing that, if you can see, it's starting to have this curvature that matches my palm, okay? And I'll keep doing that to the point where we get to this pot here and some of the pots that you can see in various stages to the point where it gets to have a bottom like this. And then depending on whenever I'm ready, we would also use a paddle. You saw that in the video as well. Okay, and this paddle in particular has a beautiful little dip into it. Um, so that also helps with that curvature. And essentially what I would do is I, my hand is inside here, I'm using my knuckle. This is my tool of measurement, the flatness of my knuckle here. And I'm gonna use this as an as a angle and you can kind of see how that's going. But I have to, I'm basically doing like this on my knuckle. But I have to keep it going in the round. Okay, so I, it has to keep moving and I have it on my knee. And you saw how Miss Winnie kept going round and round. I have to do the same thing with this technique. And essentially what happens is it develops this beautiful curve, but also if I really, depending on the pressure, I'll have a beautiful point. And that's, how we would uh, finish this pot. To finish the pot, you would create a, a base or a ring which would be called the feet. And put some shoes on my pot. Mm. Okay. But essentially that's what 
That's what we would do to finish this pot. I would keep going to, to, until I was satisfied. And then uh, we would have a ring, because to do it right, the pot would not stay upright on its own. It would just teeter off, which, which, is, which means I did it the right way. So I'll uh -huh. just, yes, ma'am. Perfect. So you would, this, this uh, supports the pot. It finishes the pot. Um, this is the feet of the pot. Okay, that's what we would call it. And you can have it in all different beautiful decorations, but this is how we would finish the pot, just like this. Here's a baby pot. Yay! Okay, Sit it so next now, to the mama. Yeah. Now, basically, I think you've gotten the idea of two ways that you can handle the clay. Oh, let me say this, because this is usually how I get really strange information that's very helpful. If any of you know any ceramic artists on the West Coast who are uh, probably, they'd have to be, because I, I did a cutoff age also for my book. I'm writing a book on uh, the history of African-American ceramics 17th to the 20th century. Uh, so the list I had for California, because this is like 40 years ago, and they changed their phone numbers. I couldn't believe it. Okay, that wasn't funny. Okay, so stand up is not my thing. <laughs> but I, I'm serious about that. If you happen to just know someone, uh, please let me know. Something that's striking to me is that since you're collecting your own stories, you really encourage everyone to write their stories. Yes. Or this, not just yes. individuals. Can you talk about that? I, I didn't talk about that, but uh, a long time ago, uh, somebody wrote the first article on my work. And they came and interviewed me. And it was full of, it, you wouldn't even think that we talked. And it occurred to me that I'm having, so hard, so I'm having a difficult time, not a hard time, but a difficult time ident identifying people on the West Coast. And um, so I started, first I started by telling the African-American ceramicists that I knew, write your own story, write your own story. I wrote, a, I wrote an essay for a, a book by uh, N. Abrams talking about um, Oh, I can't think of the name of the book, but it, it was big time. And I, I wrote my essay about the history of African-American ceramicists. I got a Renwick Fellowship based on my research on African-American ceramicists. And um, because uh, the editor, not, not Janet Cardin, but a sub-editor, uh, they would send me a copy of, of what, you know, I, I would send them my essay, and then they would send me, you know, whatever they wanted to change. Well, she and I had a rolling argument with, uh, she was talking about slave people. I said, they're captives. She said, well, they're slaves. I said, they're captives. They have always been captives. I said, and if you think that somebody was happy being, okay, so I can't, I can't do she uh, kept changing it. And then, so normally when you write an article like that, <clears throat> you get the final blue line. She didn't send it to me. So she made a horrible mistake in my, uh, in my um, essay. She said that uh, Joseph Gilliard taught at Hampton Institute for 47 years and, and uh, retired from Howard University. How stupid can you be? You know, but if, if it, it's, it's, just, it's been very, it's been, it's been a wonderful experience getting this information for this book because I must give the Smithsonian full kudos because they, they kept me there during my uh, Renwick time. Um, first, they gave me a, a teacher fellowship because I don't think that they thought I could get the information. And just in a few months after they gave me that, it's like all this information fell out of the sky into my lap. And that's the way it has been with this, getting this book together. And, uh, you know, I told the woman who kept changing, you know, the name, 
I said, you don't have a right to name my ancestors. I said, I'm the only one with that right. So I, I just tell people now, you have to write your own story. You have to write your, and I just used to say it to, I mean, I would say it to these young people. And they would say to me, well, I don't have a story. You do have a story. Everybody has a story and you need to write it because if something happens to you, what's going to represent you? The truth or however it's done. I mean, you know how, how the truth is being manipulated today. So uh, I, I think it's important. I think it's important. And I think that you all need to uh, tell other people, if you think it's important, that they should write their own book. But thank you so much. Thank you.